Okay, and we're rolling. Today's date is July 10, 2013. The subject interviewed is Peter G. Kelly. The interviewer is Anthony Roy. The interview was recorded at 100 Pearl Street, Suite 1700, Hartford, Connecticut. The interviewer is working for the Connecticut Civil War Commemoration Commission as a part of the commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. If you could uh, state and spell out your name, please. Uh, Peter Kelly, P-E-T-E-R, Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Middle name is Galbraith, G-A-L-B-R-A-I-T-H. Uh, my current home address is 29 High Point in Middle Haddam, Connecticut. Uh, I am an attorney, and I should say a recovering attorney, <laughs> uh, and uh, was born in Hartford on June 30, 1937. So could you give us any uh, memories or recollections of Hartford? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, my, my family has been, my Irish side of my family has been uh, in the Hartford area since the 1870s. Um, my grandfather and his brother uh, worked uh, stonecutters in uh, southern England for many, many years, uh, earning uh, their their boodle, if you will. And they came to Hartford uh, with the objective of continuing work as stonecutters. Um, in the course of things, they leased or bought, I can't tell you which, uh, what is now the south campus of Trinity uh, for a farm. It's the remnants of Retreat Farm after uh, Mr. Batterson sold the northern half to the state of Connecticut, to the Trinity College. Um, and they bought a stone company from uh, James Batterson. And that was actually opened in 1886. Over my shoulder is actually a photograph of my grandfather and his brother uh, as they just purchased the little stone company. So the family's been around for a long time in, uh, in the stone business. Uh, I kind of love to look at tra Travelers, uh, the Travelers Tower, my grandfather did the stonework on. The two buildings to the north, my father did a precast to the east, my brother did. And the portico on the south side of the tower, my nephews did, so as stone cutters. Um, the business started in 1886, it closed in 1987. Believe it or not, the victim of the interstate highway system. Um, now that uh, quarries could cut stone at home and uh, and ship it without it being broken and that was the end of regional stone companies. Uh, I was born in, uh, uh, literally on the farm uh, in the south end. I was raised in a three three family houses that my grandfather had, had built for his kids. There were nine of 13 children survived so there was one in each of the floors of these three three family houses. They still stand there. Uh, my family was on the second floor of the middle house. Uh, I was age one when we did the good American thing. We actually, in 1938, my father bought a single family house, which was considered pretty, pretty amazing at that point. And so we moved to 59 Eastview Street. And that's where I was raised through the war. And uh, until 1948, uh, we bought a home, my father bought a home on Grandview Terrace, 266 Grandview Terrace, where we lived until uh, I escaped to uh, homeland. So, um, it was, uh, the, of course, in Hartford at that time, it was uh, an interesting place. Uh, you know, we paid our bills by uh, me on a Saturday morning taking cash, getting on a bus, going downtown, walking to the Connecticut, whatever the Connecticut Bank Trust was walking to uh, 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 the, the, the electric company, the gas company, actually paying your bills in, in cash. Um, life was simpler. Um, I've got lots of childhood memories. Uh, I, I, I'm in the course of writing a book and I, I did a little section on, uh, on childhood. And I have very specific memories, uh, age two, uh, for example, of uh, wanting to hide from my parents and uh, getting inside a pillowcase and pulling all my toys in after me. Uh, now, I couldn't do that now unless you had a monster pillowcase, but I did it then, so I had to be pretty young. And I actually have a memory of that. Um, we were all hobbyists. Um, I was a, a one who built model airplanes and 
model ships. Um, we uh, all played ball. I was a catcher. All Kellys are in uh, sports that doesn't require running. So we're catchers, goalkeepers, that sort of thing. So I was a catcher. I have a great broken figure to prove it. Um, but more than anything, I was uh, I was a singer and a, and a kind of a, uh, you know, the, I used to run the rallies at Buckley High School when I was in high school. I, I went to Buckley High School. It's a public high school in the South End. Uh, I was scheduled to go to Loomis, but I didn't really want to do that. So I, instead of going to Loomis, I got on the bus and got off at Buckley. And my father didn't learn that till about eight weeks later when he asked where the bill was from Loomis. Anyway, I spent four years at Buckley, got out in 1955. Um, it was actually a wonderful experience. Uh, the education given then at that time was extraordinary. I went on to Georgetown University where I, um, you know, found a real, real joy. Uh, it was a, a place of, of excellence in terms of uh, academics. Um, I joined a singing group. I later became the head of that singing group. I became a soloist uh, in the Georgetown Glee Club uh, under a wonderful director, uh, a, a widely known uh, a musician named Paul Chandler Hume, best known for Harry Truman and calling him a son of a bitch in 1948. Um, but it was an extraordinary experience, uh, both, both academically, spiritually, and, and good fun. I then went to Yale Law School. Yale Law School is a extraordinary place. Uh, the admissions are the top half of 1% of college graduates in America. A very competitive place in a very gentlemanly way. Um, that too was a great experience. I quickly joined, I was on the, I earned the right to be on the Yale Law Journal. I uh, did lots of interesting writing. Um, most importantly, uh, was given a source and site check on a 400-page article on apartheid, and that actually designed the rest of my life uh, and tremendous focus on not only South Africa but on the workings of foreign countries. Um, public life, I went to New York to practice law. The reason I did that was, uh, as and I explained it to my father, he was very upset with me. Dad, uh, uh, would you have just simply gone to work for your father and? done that? He said, well, no, I didn't do that. I said, well, I'm not going to do that either. Uh, everything here is set for me, and I just want to go prove to myself that it's that I've got the stuff. So I went to uh, work in a law firm in New York called Townley Updike, Carter and Rogers. That's the same Updike that's in the name here. Uh, I spent three years there. Uh, again, had a great experience, a lot of, a lot of interesting work. Uh, one of those, uh, I was on a, a litigation team of five that we would spend a, a week without going home in our office writing briefs and the like. Uh, hard work, but a wonderful experience. When I came back, I had the objective of running for Congress. That was going to be what I did. Um, as things turned out, 1966, I actually ran the congressional campaign of Mim Diderio. Uh, who was a four, a three-termer at that point, and then I ran his re-election in 1968. And as things turned out, in 1970, he decided to run for governor. It was a mistake, but that's what he wanted to do. Uh, I was actually tendered the nomination for the Hartford seat. Uh, there were 16 candidates fighting it out, but uh, the people who tendered it me, that would have been the end of it. And after lots and lots of thought, all night, one night, my wife and I said, let's not do that. That, was, that would put you in a position uh, where you still haven't made your life uh, 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 in, a, in a position where you'd end up justifying yourself by only getting elected. And we said, enough of that. We're not going to do that. So instead, I went to the other side of politics. Uh, I started things like I was chairman of the, the city, the, the uh, uh, Charter Revision Commission of Hartford in, I think, 1967. Uh, I ran the uh, legislative elections in 1968. I ran the gubernatorial in 1970. Became Democratic chairman here, which is a great tradition in my family. Grandfather, father, brother, me, uh, in the mid-70s. And then, uh, by some uh, uh, unusual thing, ended up in national politics. Um, we 
uh, were very early on with Jimmy Carter, when he was Jimmy Who, and uh, being a regular party guy, I was really unusual. There were very few regular party guys who were for Jimmy Carter. So I ended up uh, working on the political side of the Carter administration, um, running the delegate selection program against uh, Ted Kennedy, a fascinating thing to do, and then ultimately as treasurer of the Democratic Party. Uh, I was asked to raise money. I frankly never raised money in big sums like that. I raised a lot of $100 money, but this was five and $10,000 money. And it turned out that after about six months, I was the largest fundraiser in America, and I just didn't know it. <laughs> so I got a chance to uh, run the fundraisers, and that's what I did for a long period of time. Um, after the, I, I was treasurer of the Democratic Party, then I became national finance chairman for four years. And uh, that was after the Carter loss in 1980. And then in 1984, uh, had enough of that life. Uh, and instead, uh, started working with Nancy Pelosi, who I've known forever. She was then Democratic State Chairman of California. And she and I, working with George Mitchell, ran the uh, Senate Campaign Committee. Um, I did the, uh, the actual recruitment of candidates and, of course, the fundraising. Um, keys to success? Uh, oh, there are lots of them. One, one I think, is to be very mindful that wherever you are is uh, a result of lots of things and not all of them your own self. The way I phrase it is, uh, I started out on third base. I know I didn't hit a triple. Um, it was the, the benefit of coming uh, in as a fourth child of a, of a, a very powerful and successful man uh, and a successful business and uh, I had an advantage. Staying on third base, however, required a lot of exercise of work and, and talents and success and, and fun and good luck. And uh, so I managed to stay on third base. I might even have gotten home, I'm not sure. But the, the, one of the keys to success is to never forget where you came from. Uh, never think that where you are is the place where God gave you uh, this power. Uh, the second is uh, to volunteer, to be part of anything you can do to help the community. Um, I've worked all over the world in situations where people were helpless, had no capacity to deal for themselves. That might be in the form of a democratization of a country um, or the development of a legal system in a country or frankly here, uh, something we started seven years ago, a, a thing called multi-house of care, where people come who have never seen a doctor, who never would see a doctor, and they come and they're treated just like they would be if they went to your doctor, uh, and become sort of family members of this uh, particular uh, uh, provision of primary health care. So, sense of community is critical, uh, volunteering, is what makes our country great. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably, if you look at seriously, that would be the keys to success. Advice to generations of the future. Um, one, of, one of the tragedies of, uh, of modern culture is the volunteerism I talked about, which uh, is, is the key thing, the key differential of the United States uh, from Europe. Uh, people step up, they volunteer to support the community in lots of different ways. Ben Franklin first wrote about it, uh, a, a great study, a political science study done by a, a French lord, wrote a wonderful book about it, uh, and he came to the conclusion that the one distinguishing factor of Americans from Europeans was a desire to volunteer and to support their community. Unfortunately, succeeding generations have turn more inward and, and are not looking out uh, in the main for uh, the ability to, uh, to help the community. Uh, I'm not quite sure what impact that's going to have because uh, the absence of volunteers at the age brackets of 50 plus um, is going to leave organizations 
uh, basically transferring leadership from older people like myself to much younger people. And what impact that has, I don't know, but it can't be good. So my advice to generations is renew that spirit that, uh, that, that affected the United States the way it has called volunteerism. Legacy? Uh, the only legacy you could leave that's worthwhile, I think, is to be known to have maintained your word uh, in, in the three rules of my father, loyalty is everything, die for your friends, um, to respect the uh, opponent you may be facing, because frankly, if it weren't for him, there'd be no need for you, <laughs> and three, uh, do not, uh, do not uh, in any way reward someone who has violated their word. So I, I think you know one's word is important, one's energy is important. Um, I hope that I'm remembered as being one who um, stepped in when stepping in was important in various organizations. Could you um, just really quickly talk a little bit more about Hartford as a community, Hartford maybe even uh, at, the, at its height in your opinion? Sure. Um, interestingly, I, uh, my son gave me, bought to me um, a, a, a scrapbook that had been done uh, by my father from 1935 to uh, 1956. And I'd seen it before and I thumbed through it last week and it's fascinating stuff. But Hartford at its maximum was about 143,000 people. Uh, at that point in history, the suburbs had not yet grown. Um, you know, I mean, I, the West Hartford was a lot of farms. Uh, Bloomfield was all dairy farms. Uh, that just hadn't grown. And Hartford and other cities were very key um, political and cultural factors uh, in, in the state. Uh, as expansion and the spreading of people took place, uh, unfortunately, the urban centers declined with the immigration of large numbers of Minorities. Now you understand, minority depends upon where you are. In, 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 in 1890, an Irishman was a minority. In, in 1930, an Italian was a minority. A Polish guy was a minority in 1950. So the minority de definition changes. But what happens is the minorities are always attracted to the urban centers. And uh, in the numbers of people that have come to urban centers from Puerto Rico and uh, from historic uh, uh, African resource, uh, sources going back many generations, um, the city uh, has to take on incredible burdens uh, to take care of them. Um, the Hartford uh, was probably at its strongest um, about 30 years ago when we were still working at it. Uh, but it, since then, it, the, the burdens have just become incredible. Um, the presence of government absorbing uh, tax revenues, uh, the actual um, tearing down of hundreds of homes that uh, were uh, late for their taxes, um, and the concentration of, of minorities makes it very difficult for a city to sustain itself financially. Um, what, what kind of hope is there for the future? Well, the hope is different. Uh, the city as such, uh, it's hard to think how a city is going to get out of uh, the morass that it's in. It just, uh, its, uh, its resources are limited, its demands are high. Uh, the only way that will work will be if we actually get to some form of regionalization, or certainly of some of the functions of the urban center. The reality is the, the cities everywhere, the cities in Blueback Square, the cities in Manchester Center, the cities everywhere, the cities at the, in the big malls out in, out in Manchester. That's where people do their shopping, that's where people go for food, and that's what is the city. And uh, there's so many things that can be done on a regional basis much better. Certainly police protection is done, uh, even education a large bit of it is already done with, uh, with uh, magnet schools and 
uh, other busing situations. There's a whole range of things uh, that, that can be done better on a regional basis. When we get to that, I'm not sure. We have 169 towns. They all like to be isolated and uh, don't like to be controlled by anybody. But reality is going to step in on everybody with the limitation of resources and the demands for money. So uh, the future to me is uh, a regionalized function uh, set up. Uh, perhaps going back to the old county system, we used to have eight counties, which we eradicated in 1958. Terrible mistake, but that's what we did. Uh, and, and hopefully that will be a better model for us. So um, I guess you're talking a little bit about hit the Hartford and the future. So how is your family's history, how is that connected to Hartford? When um, over my shoulder, I think it's here. You, uh, you'll see uh, that's a that's a page from uh, the Hartford Directory, and it shows uh, about uh, one third of a page. Kelly Brothers, Cutstone Contractors. Uh, behind me here is the 1886 picture of them starting their stoneworks from what was Batterson's, and that's a billhead up there of a the billhead they used in 1899. So, somewhat unusual for Irish because Irish used to be called turkeys because you know turkeys are the dumbest animal in life, and the Irish that came here generally were uh, rural Irishmen who had no education and frankly didn't even speak English, and uh, you know so they were viewed as as uh, very very uh, uh, poor contributors to society. So my grandfather and his brother were happily very successful. Um, they started, they, they bought this existing stone company from James Batterson and they made it work. Uh, they somehow survived the, um, the uh, uh, depression in 1929, which absolutely stopped uh, stone business for four or five years. And then it upped again and then the war came in 1941 and that was the end of the stone business there. At that point my father, understanding that, started a cinder block plant company and that's how construction was being done. It turned out a very successful company, which he sold uh, in 1955. So the family's been active in business uh, since 1886. Um, they actually ran a farm uh, in the South End, uh, which is the south part of Retreat Farm. They were very actively uh, involved in politics. Uh, my father uh, went up through the usual grades and was uh, allied with a, uh, an Italian leader named Tony Zazzaro, Tony Z. Uh, and uh, there was another guy named Thomas Spellacy. He was the other faction. Uh, interestingly enough, you're sitting in Updike, Kelly, and Spellacy. Uh, Kelly's and the Spellacy's hated one another in the 30s and 40s. And here we are, uh, the sons, partners of almost 50 years uh, in the practice of law. Um, but anyway, but, uh, my father was very active in politics. His, his nickname was Blackjack. It's either because he had dark hair or he hit hard. I'm not sure which, but his name was Blackjack. He was a man of very few words. Um, he said yes or he said no. If he said yes, it happened. If he said no, it didn't. And that was the way it ran then. Uh, and, and somebody asked me a question about this about a year ago and I said well one of the reasons you know, that I have a sense of social obligation is you got to remember in the 30s and 40s there was no welfare system so the welfare system was the political system so I was raised a significant part of my life sitting in black homes there was a great black woman leader named uh, Mary Watt, uh, Park Parkman Watson, and she was the one that everybody went to, and she would go to my father. And so they had this process where they could take care of people in trouble, and that's what they did, because there was nothing else. And so that's the way I was raised, and uh, obviously now we have all these structures, but unfortunately st people still need help. My brother uh, went to Trinity College, graduated in 1949, uh, he, after my father's death, he became Democratic chairman of Hartford. 
And uh, then in the 70s, uh, with a high school classmate becoming the boss of the city council, Nick Carbone, I became the Democratic town chairman, uh, and which I did for four years before I went off to Washington to be part of the running of the National Party. Could you tell me a little bit about um, how you, how your family acquired the Forlorn Soldier Monument? Sure. Well, first of all, the, the, the immigrants in my family, my particular family, um, is my paternal grandfather came here from Ireland with his brother in the 1870s. Uh, a fine Scottish Presbyterian lady named Mary Elizabeth Galbraith came here too, from the same town in Northern Ireland, from Armagh, A-R-M-A-A-G-H. Uh, they did not know one another, but they met here and they married here. So that's why I bear the middle name Galbraith. That's my grandmother, paternal grandmother's uh, maiden name, Peter Galbraith Kelly. My mother was actually born in Denmark. She came, I, I actually have the name of the ship, the name of her cabin. Uh, she came here at the age of 30 days with two older sisters and her mother, and ultimately the father came. And they were farmers as well. Uh, my mother was raised on what a farm was now called the University of Hartford. Um, uh, I have pictures of her standing in the, in the pond that's prominently displayed in, the, uh, in anything that the University of Hartford issues. I have her standing with cows that she milked in that pond. Um, so, they're all immigrants. Um, the stone business, uh, uh, obviously, my grandfather and his brother were aggressive business people. They wanted to do, uh, go into business. Uh, it made sense if they could find a company that was already in existence uh, that they should buy that. Batterson was coming of an age uh, where his health wasn't good, he was uh, getting tired. Uh, and they purchased the business from him. I have no idea what they paid for it. I have no idea whatsoever. That stuff is lost, uh, at least to me. Um, none of them were particularly educated. I, my father, for example, uh, he went to, obviously, to high school, and he went to a two-year business school called, I can't remember, it's just, it was just down the street here, was at the corner of Asylum and uh, uh, Ann Street. Uh, it begins with H, can't remember the name of the school. But it was a little, you know, it was a little uh, two-year college. Uh, but in those days, you know, there weren't a lot of people who were uh, into books very much. They had a practical life. They did what they had to do. Um, I think I was the first member of our family to go on beyond college. I went to law school, obviously. And uh, now we call ourselves JDs. Back then it was an LLB, a Bachelor of Laws. Uh, but I was uh, the first, I think, to do that. Um, and what do you know about the, uh, the monument, the former soldier monument? Well, there, you know, there are lots of tales, and uh, the, the tale that, that, uh, that I have and uh, my, a couple of siblings have written about them and that, what have you, and it, there are all kinds of stories. But as I understand it, uh, there was a competition put out by the United States to place 500 uh, Union soldiers in the southern court houses just so they don't forget what just happened called the Civil War. It was not a very nice thing to do, but that's what the government wanted to do. Um, and obviously, uh, Mr. Batterson competed for that. And as I understand it, he created two uh, Civil War st statues uh, in brownstone. My historic understanding is that they were rejected because they had the wrong foot forward at parade rest. Uh, that would have been a, a terrible error. Uh, I hear subsequently it might be because of the material. The brownstone is not a particularly lasting stone. Uh, if you lay it up, uh, you know, it's a sedimentary stone that's been pushed down. If you put it so that the, the sedimentary seams go up and down, 
will spall, pieces will break off, and that's what's happened to this, this soldier. So uh, they, uh, 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 Batterson put this one statue on a corner of the land where the Charter Oak uh, Stone Company was. Um, my grandparents, father and his brother bought that business and the statue was there. They didn't think much about it, it was just there. Then the city of Hartford decided to condemn uh, a piece of the property uh, that would cross the property of uh, now my father's and, and his cousin. And it left the soldier on a triangular piece of land that we still own, but there was a road now in front of it. And so it sat there. Um, in 1936, there was a very bad flood here. Uh, the stone company was literally underwater. 1938, it had 19 feet of water over it. I have a picture of my father in a rowboat with his hand on a 21-foot high post. And he, he was two feet from the top. Uh, obviously, the soldier was completely underwater. So in 1938, my father had enough. Uh, he went and he uh, bought a bunch of property called Airport Road, and he located the stone company uh, down there. Um, again, in 1941, uh, with the war, uh, the stone company basically stopped doing business, and he had started a very large plant doing uh, cinder blocks. What uh, was that plant? Uh, it was on, it's, it's on called Union Place. It's a little short, stubby street off of Wethersfield Avenue. But the plant actually occupied from uh, maybe uh, 100 yards east of, of Wethersfield Avenue all the way down to the railroad tracks and all the way to Airport Road. It was a very, very large place. Because center blocks, you have to inventory them. So you might have uh, 2,000 cubes of block out there standing 20 feet high but you need a lot of space to put it there. I know I used to work there summers. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Hard work? Uh, hmm? Hard work? Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I was a college kid and I, I used to, used to what we call cube blocks. You take a, a hot block that comes out of a, a kiln and you pick it up and you stack them. The problem is your fingers get shredded pretty soon. So I, I said to my father, I gotta go buy gloves. He said, okay. So I bought gloves and after two days, the gloves would be useless. So I was buying gloves, and he said, "Stop buying gloves. Tear up your hands." So it was it was it was interesting hard work. So anyway, but the, the uh, in in uh, 1938 they they moved the plant, uh, and my father tried to move the statue uh, to this new place, and there was an uproar. Uh, newspapers, you know, Hartford politician steals public monument, things like that. Uh, I, I've, I've been looking for the article. It's, I know it's somewhere in this uh, this uh, collection of, of photos that my uh, my father put together. But I've got to dig it out. But that was uh, he, he finally said, "Heck with it! I'll leave it there." So it stood there all by itself for a long time. And then my brother came along, and I I would guess this would be oh 1970s, 1975, somewhere in there. But I can get a specific date. He moved it. He actually put the soldier on a pedestal, had a brass plate put on it uh, that, that indicates the history, and moved it to Airport Road. And then in 1987, uh, that business came to an end. Uh, my father was, had passed away. Uh, I was the executor of the estate. We actually sold the property um, and uh, reserved a 10 by 10 foot piece where the statue uh, uh, rests, um, and here we are. I, I am ecstatic that this piece of history that you know we've watched over for so many years is going to find a wonderful place uh, to to rest. It's a it's an interesting piece of history, uh, particularly given the the mixture of new and old. I mean, this is a Batterson product. Uh, at the time, he was moving the state capital from the old state house to the Trinity site, which is now called Capitol Hill, and moving Trinity to the north end of the retreat farm. Mr. Batterson did very well through all of those transactions. The Kellys came in, they left, they picked the remnants, which happened to be one statue, 
and I've had that under their uh, watch for 138 years. So why would you say this uh, monument is important? Uh, well, it's a, it's a genuine reflection of the state of mind of the Union uh, some years after the winning of the Civil War. People have a sense of the history that says, oh, you know, we were all, you know, put arms around them and, you know, you're, you're our, our lost brother. That's nonsense. There was a genuine animosity, particularly from this part of the country, uh, for the South. And so the government obviously at one point, uh, this was not Lincoln, Lincoln was different, uh, but I think Ulysses Grant is the one who's credited with uh, this very, very strong negative sort of thing. And so this, uh, this uh, uh, RF, uh, the, the request for proposals for the federal government for Union soldier to be put in the Southern Courthouse, I mean, that can't be anything but just damn mean. And so I, I, it's a piece of history. Could you tell me a little bit about uh, where the soldier's final resting place is going to be? Just for sure, yeah. I mean, if you go to the state capitol, by the way, built by James Patterson. <laughs> if you go to the state capitol, um, there are, on the first floor, there are two big areas for displays. Uh, one of them is heavily focused on Revolutionary War material and the other on Civil War. This will be placed where the Civil War material is. Um, I think that there are maybe six or five other artifacts uh, that are pure Civil War. And uh, this is going to be one of them. So. Are you going to be at the uh, rededication? Oh, I think so. Uh, we're actually planning something. Uh, you, you might imagine that uh, when two brothers, uh, John P. Kelly, that's my un great uncle, and Michael Hagen Kelly, then get married, and they have kids, and they have kids. We're talking about about 300 members of the family that exist. Uh, actually, on Monday, I'm actually going down a visit with uh, a couple of my cousins who are very careful watchers of that to see if we can pull a list together and have a little Kelly party, coincident with this uh, dedication. Uh, do you have any other uh, final comments or things you'd like to say before we close? Well, I, I think I want to say a very special thank you to Matthew Warshaw for being the driver of this. Uh, I've been working on lots of different options over the years, and frankly, if the soldier was not taken care of now, it would get really lost in history. You got way, way too far removed. I mean, I actually remember it uh, uh, when it was uh, when I was just a little kid. So um, I'm grateful to Matthew and to all the people who are involved in it. That's uh, going to be fun.